Hello, everybody. How are we? It's really good to see you all. Sorry, I'm just fiddling with something. Um, yeah, how is everybody doing? Um, welcome to the Planetarium Show. I'm really, really excited to have you here. Um, just a couple of quick tech things, which you probably know, but just to make sure um, as we go through. So number one, I should probably introduce myself. My name is Kieran, and I work here at the Robes of Trees, Edinburgh. Um, and I'm an astronomer, and today we're going to have a little look at what you can see in the autumn sky. Uh, there's some ways you can interact with us. So number one, which a lot of you have found already, is um, you if you either tap on your touch screen or if you mouse over uh, Zoom, if you're using like a normal PC, um, you can hit the chat button, which will enable you to uh, Chalos, I guess. Um, so if you if you have any comments or you just want to say hi or where you're from, that would be great. You should put them in there. And then there's also the Q and A button. So if you have any um, sort of concrete questions you want to ask, we actually have two space experts who are on hand to answer all of your uh, questions about space as we go through. Uh, Kieran, uh, other Kieran and Ramil, do you want to say hi? I wasn't addressing myself in the third person. Hi, I'm the non-Kieran. I'm Ramil. <laughs> Um, and I'm a professor uh, here at uh, the Royal Observatory. Hi, so I'm, yep, the other Kiron. So hopefully that doesn't get too confusing. Um, so I'm a graduate in the science group at the Astronomy Technology Center here at the ROE. So uh, I'm involved in just some telescope design and things like that. So if there's any questions along those lines, yep, shoot them. So we have an astronomy expert and a building telescope expert. Fantastic. We've got everything covered. Um, other things to keep in mind. So yeah, if you want to ask questions, they are there in the background. Just hit that Q&A button. Um, so for accessibility, there is a live transcript which should be happening. So there's a button at the bottom, which I think just says uh, enable live transcripts, and that will give you subtitles or closed captions, which they're not perfect because they're done by the robots at Zoom, but they're pretty good. And hopefully, hopefully they'll help you understand what I'm rambling about. And then finally, this is being uh, both live streamed to YouTube and recorded. So if you want to, if you missed something or you want to see something again later, you can check us out on the SDFC YouTube channel and they will be there. All right, that I think is enough of that stuff. Let's dive into space. Let's go. Okay, so I'm actually, I'm, I'm quite sad, actually, that this has ended up being online again. I mean, obviously, we want everybody to be safe. And if you've ever been to the observatory in person, it's an incredibly cramped place. And we, we want you to be safe more than anything, which is why we opted to do such things online. But that does give us some advantages. So this is a little program called Stellarium, which lets you look around the sky. And this is roughly what you would see on a really, really nice day from the roof of the observatory. So over here, this is one of the observation towers. This is the West Observation Tower. And then over here, we've got the, the East Observation Tower. And the reason that this is actually kind of cool is because normally you go up here and you go, oh, great, I can see all over the city. So for example, I can see the castle down there. It's a little bit blurry, but you can see the castle pretty well. And then you can see Arthur's Seat, which is the really famous uh, big hill in the middle of Edinburgh in Holyrood Park. And you can see loads and loads of other stuff in the city. So it's very blurry, but down here, that's actually the sea. That's the North Sea slash the Firth of Forth. So you can see all the way down from the sea from the roof. But while the view is pretty great, there is one thing that you can't do in person, which is fast forward time. So what we're going to do is we're up here at about you know quarter to two, but there's not many, really many stars to see at quarter to two. So there's no reason why we can't just Fast forward time, so we're going to go to about 6 p.m. So the sun is setting here behind the West Tower, and we're starting to see some stars come out. So yeah, it, it's a really, really handy little thing. Um, so actually, let's go a little bit further. So 6 p.m. is about when the sun kind of sets in uh, the UK around now, around autumn. But let's go to 9 p.m. So. Sun's gone all the way down and the stars are going to start to come out. And on a clear night, you can see absolutely loads of stars. And it's really difficult to kind of know 
what stars we're talking about. So if I just pointed a star like this one, I would just go, well, it's that one. Um, it's hard to know which one I'm talking about, especially if, say, you were with me and I was writing you a letter or an email or something to know. So what we do is we divide the stars up into patterns, which we call constellations. So these are all of the constellations in the uh, northern sky, and they're usually attached to myths. So the constellations we tend to use in the UK are the Greek constellations. So they tend to be involved in Greek myths and legends and things like that. And this is just a choice. This is just what we chose to do. Lots of other cultures have um, different constellations. They divide the stars up differently. And you could even make your own if you wanted to, as long as everybody kind of knows what we're talking about, what they're just used to divide the sky up and to tell some really nice stories along the way. Um, so we're going to start off talking about actually my favorite constellation. It's my favorite constellation because it's one of see, which is the plow. So the plow is these seven stars here. And the plow is visible all year round. They're really nice, bright stars. And it looks like lots of things. So I always think it looks like a saucepan. But then when it's the other way up, people imagine it's a plow. So if you can imagine this flipped over, this is the bit where you detach the horse teeth. And then this would like dig into the ground. Um, but it's got lots and lots of other names. And I can tell you lots of things about the plow, but I want to show you one of my favorite little secrets to start off to do with the plow. And it's to do with this star here. So the star in the middle of the handle. And maybe if you've got really good eyes, you can actually already see what's going on, but we're going to zoom in a little bit. So you can imagine if you had really, really great eyes, you might be able to zoom in. And you'll notice that this star, which is called Mizar, is actually a double star. It has another star next to it here, and these stars um, orbit around each other. And there's lots and lots of stories about this star, which I really, really like. So one story tells of it being an eyesight test. So if you joined uh, the Roman army, I believe it was, um, they would you know, point you at the star and you'd say, oh, take a look and what do you see? And if you say one star, then they would assign you to the infantry, they give you a sword. Whereas if you have really, really good eyesight, you go, oh, I can see two stars. Well, then they would assign you to be like an archer or a scout or something like that. Um, I don't know whether this is true. I like it as a story. Though. Um, another one, which is from Japan, is, uh, to, again, to do with the star and to do with aging. So you might know that your eyes get kind of uh, worse as you age. And this star was kind of an indicator of whether you were old or not. So... In Japan, if you can only see one star here, then you're kind of officially old, which I think is quite fun. Um, but what I think it's really cool is we can do better. So we have this double star, but what happens if we go in further? Well, we get this third star here called Ludwig's star, but we're going to go past that, and we're going to realize that Mizar itself even has another star around it. So you've got Mizar, the main one you can see, you've got Alacor, You've got a Ludwig star. You've got this mysterious fourth star here. And then it turns out as late as 2009, there was discovered a fifth and a sixth star. So this is actually six stars all together. And I just think it's amazing that this is something that people have probably been staring at for tens of thousands of years. And that there's still little uh, secrets to be had in the plow. So I just thought I would show that to you. Right. So... The plow, as I mentioned, it's a constellation that's viewed year round. You can see the plow um, all throughout the year. And there's a few other constellations which are kind of in this pattern. So these are these are all the constellations, and uh, we're going to see a couple of them. So if you take the plow and if you take its sort of saucepan shape and you follow that up, you actually get to this star here. And this is another really, really special star. And this is Polaris, or the North Star. And the North Star is special basically because if you went to the North Pole, this star would be directly above your head. And that produces uh, some really weird things that happen. So, for example, we're going to advance to midnight now. So we're at about 9 p.m. And if we go to midnight, you'll see that all the other stars spin around, but the Pole Star stands alone and it stays still. So this star is really special because it stays still in the sky. It never moves. And also, it always points exactly north. So if we look down a little bit, you'll notice that our compass point 
it's directly above north. So if you can find the plough in the sky and you can take these two stars on the far hand, far hand side, far hand side, yeah, far hand side of the source band, and you can just follow those up and the next brightest star you hit is the north star. And you can always use that to, to find your way north. So then we have these, these constellations, which are always visible all throughout the year. And another one I really like is this one up here. So this is Cassiopeia. Um, Cassiopeia, I always think, either looks like a W or an N or something like that. But the Greeks believed that it looked like a very vain lady sitting in a chair staring at a mirror. I'll be honest, I don't see it, but maybe they have better imaginations than I do. But that's not the only kind of constellation. So there's constellations that are viewable all throughout the year, like these three. But then there's also constellations that are seasonal. So I thought I'd show off a couple of constellations that are um, visible in autumn. And autumn is a kind of, it's a bit of a transition period between summer and winter. So I thought I would start with a, a summer constellation, which is on its way out. So this is um, a constellation which is vi really visible in summer, but in Scotland that means you have to stay up really late. But if you hang around into the autumn time, uh, you can catch this constellation just after sunset. So there's kind of a, a couple going on here. So there is uh, number one is what's called the summer triangle. So that is these three bright stars here, which form a nice triangle. So this top one is called Danab, this one is called Vega, and this one is called Altair. And they're all kind of their brightest stars of the constellations that they uh, that they belong to. So Danab belongs to this one, Cygnus the Swan, and then Vega belongs to uh, Lyra the Lyre. And then number three, Altair belongs to Altair the Eagle. Is it Altair? Aquila the Eagle, sorry. Um, so these are kind of three separate constellations, and together they have this, this triangle between the brightest stars in them. And I really, I really like this because there's another little secret here, which is a little hard to see. But if you're in a dark room or if you have a squint, this is how you can find the Milky Way. So this is how you can find our galaxy and where that kind of sits on the sky. So you might be able to see there's a very faint up here. I um, will draw a line so we can see. It's so kind of going up here. You maybe can see a very, very faint, wispy band. And ancient people believed it looked like spilt milk or it looked like a river or something. And so this is the Milky Way. And this is where our galaxy sits on the sky. So if you want to find our galaxy, what you can do is you can find this summer triangle, and that's one of the ways that you can find where it goes. But it goes all around the sky, so you can kind of then follow this and see uh, lots of other things along its back. So that's a constellation of the summer that's kind of, it's getting earlier and early in the night, and eventually it will get so early that the sun will get entirely block it out. It will only be up in the sky during the day. So we can go to the other side now. So we can, let's head back to, to north. So we had our summer triangle over here, but we're going to head back to north. And then on the other side of the sky, we've got constellations that we're going to have to stay up really, really late for. And these are constellations that will become more and more visible uh, throughout the winter, throughout um, as days get shorter. So we are going to first advance time to 3 a.m. We have to stay up really, really late for this. Um, and then we're going to move to the other side of the sky. So we were looking over to the west then, and now we're going to look over to the east. So this is a constellation that's rising just before morning. And this is my other favorite constellation. This is Orion. So if you can, if you can stay up till 3 a.m., you will see um, Orion. So he's quite easy to spot. He has uh, these three really bright stars which form his belt. And I, I, I really like Orion because it just looks like what it is. It looks like a guy. And I think that's uh, what makes a good constellation is that it looks like uh, kind of what it is. Uh, other things to look at are his shoulders. So you might notice his left shoulder, which is called Betelgeuse, looks slightly red. That's because that's a really, really old star, which is nearing the end of its life. And then his right shoulder is called Regal, I believe. And Regal is a really, really young star and looks really blue. And in terms of stars, it won't live very long because it's really, really big and massive. 
burn spray all its fuel really quickly. So we've got kind of really, really old star, really young star. Um, there's other things to see. So if you look below his belt down here, there is a nebula called the Orion Nebula. So if you're in a really, really dark place, you'll see a bit of a fuzzy patch down here. Um, and that's a place where stars are actively being born. So there's loads and loads in this constellation. And it's also really nice because as we get into the winter months, this constellation will be visible all the way through the night. So in the dead of winter at sort of 4 or 5 p.m., this will be up and it will stay up most of the night. But unfortunately, for the moment, you'll have to stay up really quite late. So finally, we're just going to bring ourselves up to sunrise. So we're going to move to about 6 a.m. And now, if you've been staying up all night looking at the stuff, it is definitely time for bed. And I think we're going to stop there. Thank you very much for that, Kieran. That's a, a lovely tour through the sky. Um, I'm going to ask Kieran and Ramil as well to bring their cameras up because I'm sure there's people who have been watching this who've got lots of questions about the stars. Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to ask a question to our panelist, panelists. Anything that you want to ask about the tour that we've just had, about the Royal Observatory or about the night sky, I'm sure we can we can make a bit of an answer for you there. Um, there's not any questions in the questions and answer, but I think there was an interesting one earlier about the Earth revolving around the sun. So I suppose that's quite a nice place to start. Why does the Earth revolve around the sun? Anybody want to chat about that? I'll defer to our space experts. Do you want me to take it or? <laughs> okay, so that's a very good question actually. And, and you notice that why did the, so the question is from Rohan, why did Earth, the Earth start revolving around the sun? And in fact, all the planets revolve around the sun in the same direction. Um, why do they do that? And also, why is it that all the planets lie sort of in the same plane? around the sun, right? Those are all things that we see in the night sky. So the answer is two things that you're probably pretty familiar with. One is gravity and the other is merry-go-rounds, right? So essentially you remember gravity pulls things in. Merry-go-rounds, if you remember from being a kid, if you're in a spinning merry-go-round, going towards the center of the merry-go-round is very difficult, right? You really got to struggle. Whereas like standing up or down is pretty straightforward. So what happens around these stars uh, when they first start to, when they're first born, like the sun, right? So the sun started off um, basically as a cloud uh, of gas and dust, and it started collapsing due to gravity. But as it collapsed, the cloud started off spinning just a little bit. And as it collapsed, that spinning became faster and faster. That's like a ice skater is like pulling their arms in, right? So as it collapsed, the vertical directions could collapse pretty easily due to gravity, just like on a merry-go-round, but the, but the directions you know, around the rotation could not. And so what you formed was a big you know, protostar in the middle, which became the sun, and then a disk of material around that sun, right? And it's this disk of material that slowly coagulated into the planets, including the Earth, right? So that's basically why all the planets ended up rotating in the same direction and all located within a very uh, thin plane. Cool, that's a brilliant answer. Um, and very visual as well. Like I could really picture how that would all happen. Uh, we have another question here uh, from Ayush here. It says, is the Polaris star really constant as the Earth and the whole solar system is revolving around the black hole in the center of the Milky Way galaxy? So anyone want to field this one? I can take this one if you like. So this is actually, it's pretty weird actually, it's just by chance. So Polaris is just a star in our galaxy, it's not a special star or anything like that. It just so happens that if you imagine, um, you know, if you have like a globe, like one you put on your desk and you imagine that there's the stick that goes through it, it happens that Polaris is basically on that stick. So if you made that stick really, really long, Polaris is basically exactly on the stick. So as the Earth spins around, it's spinning around where Polaris is. 
And so it looks like it doesn't move, but it's not actually a particularly special star or anything like that. And actually in thousands and thousands of years time, because the stars in our galaxy don't stay where they are, they kind of shift around, um, it won't stay there forever. So in thousands and thousands of years time, we won't have a North Star and we'll have to be more creative if we get lost in the woods and want to find our way home. Well, thanks for that, Kieran. Um, another question there. Uh, what is the star that has been most recently discovered or most recently been discovered? Anybody on our panel know that? That's quite a good challenging question. I think that's a very difficult one to, to answer. I think we're discovering probably millions and millions, you know, pretty frequently now. Like one of the instruments that I'm uh, working on at the moment uh, is going to be doing a big survey of the night sky. And the goal is, I think, to get millions of uh, stars, look at their chemical composition, get really detailed information about them um, for millions of stars over the course of a, a few years. So it's really, we're kind of entering into this phase of astronomy where there's so much information and it's really interesting to kind of be able to look at the different aspects and get really kind of big kind of statistical information about all these really cool uh, astronomical uh, objects. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think actually that's one of the reasons that the Royal Observatory of Edinburgh is kind of a, an interesting place to work because lots of this looking up and thinking is happening is happening right here. Um, we've got a nice one here from Sunshine asking any advice for starting astrophotography or astrophotography. Hmm, good question. So I think my advice would be start cheap. And you can actually get really, really good pictures with, um, you know, quite cheap equipment. So my first thing, my, my list of things that I would, I would start with is a smartphone with a fairly decent camera, which you probably already have, and then learn how to use um, the kind of advanced settings. So mine has one called like Pro Mode, and it lets you change the various settings like uh, the ISO, which is basically the sensitivity, and the exposure time and things like that. And if you have something that will let you do that, you can actually get quite a long way just taking pictures. So the first thing I would buy is a tripod. You can buy these for about 10, 15 quid. And then you can just kind of plant your phone somewhere and take a really long exposure picture of something. And if you do that, you can actually get really, really good results. And that would be a good start. Um, anything more advanced with that, like hooking it up to a telescope and things like that, you very quickly get to quite expensive and quite involved and difficult. Um, so I would start out with that. And then if you get the bug, there's tons and tons of guides online of how to kind of progress from there, I would say. You're on mute, Abby. Abby, you're muted. doesn't want to unmute. Oh, that's that's fun. You're force muted. Weird. I, I can ask the questions. I'm, I'm taking over the show. Okay. Um, oh, this is a good one. So what is the oldest star? Oldest star. Uh, well, go ahead, Kieran. Um, so I think, yeah, so I think there is a, so if we go back right back to the Big Bang, so there's this kind of beginning of the universe and we get to kind of quite a long time before we go from there to kind of star forming. Um, we have a kind of period known as the dark ages um, where there's just not enough material that's quite uniform uh, to get into these kind of star uh, forming uh, kind of ages. So you basically get some sort of slight um, kind of non-uniformity or some slight kind of clumping and this eventually through gravity kind of brings everything together and we get these uh, uh, denser and denser regions. And then eventually that can, that, that can bring us into kind of star forming ages. And I think, uh, I think I'm not 100% sure, it's about 350,000 years after the, the Big Bang, I think is when we kind of get to the big, really kind of early, early stars. So that would make it just over 13 billion years ago from now, which is pretty old. <laughs> It's a really interesting question, I think, in physics at the moment. I think there's a lot of people trying to um, build telescopes that can look back uh, and try and find some of these really early stars, because um, we've not really 
detected uh, or we don't know that we've detected them yet. Um, There's also another angle to this, which is some of the older stars are still with us now. So when you have a really small star, it kind of just lives forever because they burn so slowly. So there's people actually looking in our galaxy for really, really old stars. Um, so there's lots and lots of different ways to think about it because, yes, yeah, some of them will live. They're not with us old, as my mom says. Yeah, it's really cool because the way they look for it, uh, these, these super old stars, is actually using their composition. So if you remember Carl Sagan's old quote that we are all made of stardust, what that means is that essentially in the at the time of the Big Bang, the only elements formed were hydrogen and helium. So the very er earliest stars will have very low abundances of things like oxygen and carbon, you know, the things we associate with life. And so we can try to detect that uh, with these stars. And Kieran was just talking about a, a new facility that's going to try to image, you know, get the chemical composition of stars. That's one of the things you're hoping for is to be able to find these extremely old stars by their chemical composition. All right, I think we've got time for one more question. So that's the question before that. Um, oh, I like this one. Okay. How do constellations change over time due to stars dying or being born or kind of whatever, really? That's a great question from Abigail. Thank you. Either of you want to take it? <laughs> In general, not over human lifetimes. Uh, what they, what the constellations do do is um, move, shift in the sky. So, uh, for instance, uh, you might, you know, know your astrological sign. Uh, I'm a Taurus. Okay. Uh, what that means is that at the time of my birth, what that's supposed to mean is that at the time of the, my birth, the sun is in the constellation of Taurus. The thing is, that astrological system was uh, invented about 3,000 years ago uh, in essentially what, what is now Mesopotamia or what was Mesopotamia. Um, so the problem is that constellations have shifted in the sky because the earth is sort of processing like a top. And so today, the sun is no longer in Taurus when I was born, as it turns out, despite the fact that we've now associated Taurus with this time you know, around May, or April, that that is supposed to be that. So, uh, so the constellations themselves have been pretty constant uh, over the time of humans have been around. Uh, however, over longer time scales, they certainly do. Uh, stars certainly do are born, they die. Uh, a lot of these bigger stars that uh, that Kieran was pointing out, things like Vega, uh, probably won't be around in about five or ten million years. Uh, so if you, uh, you know, put yourself on ice and come back, then um, you won't see that star anymore. I think I really love thinking about this is that the dinosaurs would have seen entirely different constellations. Entirely different sky. Every bright blue star in the sky probably wouldn't have been alive. So yeah. the sky would have looked completely different, which I think is absolutely mind-blowing. I can picture dinosaurs and I can picture them being around, but space would have been completely Right, I think that is all the questions we have time for. So I just have to thank you all so much for coming. I hope you, I hope you had fun. I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question. If you tweet to us, which I'll put on Twitter in a thing in a minute, we will be happy to uh, answer them there and things like that. Um, so yeah, the last thing that I have to say. So we have uh, another event happening today. I think this is our final event for today. Yeah. So we have our. Uh, short talk series, which will be the, the final um, final event of the day, which you can check out. I'm putting the link in the chat in a second. Um, so they're shaping up to be really fun, and there you can learn what people research and what kind of mysteries they're discovering in space. Um, we have a website, so if you want to check out the open day more generally, you can visit us at roe.ac.uk slash bdod. 2021. Uh, again, that's linked in the chat, and you can uh, see what see what everybody's up to in the labs and things like that. Have a poke around, and then yeah, if you want to reach out to us on Twitter, we are at Royal Ops, and we'll be happy to answer any questions we didn't get to, or if you just want to chat, we're around. Thank you so much, everybody, and I'll see you soon.